It was an ordinary, bustling lunch hour at Mamma Mia's Pizza in Erie, Pennsylvania on August 28, 2003. Phones rang off the hook with incoming orders. Amidst the chaos, one fateful call came in. The caller, voice unclear, placed an order for two piping hot, extra-large sausage and pepperoni pizzas. Mamma Mia's portly owner struggled to make out the garbled address provided. He handed the phone to his loyal employee, 46-year-old Brian Wells, who stood just over five feet tall with a balding head. Wells jotted down the address. 8631 Peach Street, believing it to be nothing more than a routine delivery. He hopped into his Geo Metro and headed south down Peach Street, as he had countless times before. Yet mere hours later, a shocking scene unfolded on live television. Brian Wells, bomb strapped around his neck, was surrounded by state troopers in the parking lot of an eyeglass world after robbing a bank. Wells claims to police that a group of black men fastened the bomb to him and forced him to rob a bank. After gently pleading for help for 30 minutes, Wells says, Why is nobody trying to get this thing off me? I don't have much time. It's going to go off. I'm not lying. At 3.18 p.m., the bomb emits a loud beep and then detonates, killing Wells as he falls backward, with police unable to help. The bomb squad arrives two minutes too late. These collar bombs were only known to be used by Colombian drug lords before, making their use in Erie very odd. Stranger still, police find handwritten instructions with drawings telling Wells how to rob the bank and remove the bomb collar addressed to the bomb hostage. It seems Wells was telling the truth. He was sent on a doomed hunt with his life as the reward. At first glance, this case seems straightforward. A clear victim forced into a horrific situation, but as investigators uncovered more details, doubts emerged about Wells' role. As I mentioned, things aren't always as they appear. Though Wells seemed like an obvious victim, looks can be deceiving. Let's dig deeper into Wells' story. His neighbor, Linda Payne, described him as an ordinary, if eccentric, Pennsylvania resident. He liked to help people. He'd get breakfast at McDonald's with the newspaper, then come home to hang out until work. Really shy fella. He took the hubcaps off his car because they were too shiny, she recalled. Payne considered him the perfect tenant. At 46, Wells lived a quiet life alone with his three cats. He worked at Mamma Mia's Pizzeria for 10 years, rarely missing a day except once when a beloved cat passed away. By all accounts, nothing hinted that this man would soon be at the center of a high-stakes bank heist. Let's examine the fateful timeline of that August afternoon. At around 1.47 p.m., the call came in to Mamma Mia's Pizza. Wells agreed to deliver the order. He'd arrive at the Peach Street address by 2 p.m., believing it was a routine delivery. But investigate would later uncover troubling details about the location. 8631 Peach Street was no ordinary house. It was a TV tower site, accessible only by a remote dirt road deep in the woods. When police swept the area, they discovered shoe prints matching Wells' footwear and the tire tracks of his little Geo Metro. But the site offered no clues about what happened once Wells arrived. One thing is clear, it's somewhere in these shadowy woods that Wells had the bomb collar locked around his neck. Because just 20 minutes later, around 2.20pm, Wells walked quietly into a PNC bank where wearing that sinister device. The bank sat two miles back up Peach Street. Wells also wore a t-shirt emblazoned with the word Guess, a shirt he wasn't wearing before and didn't seem to own. As witness, John Seckle recounted, Wells entered the bank with a shotgun disguised as a cane and a box concealed under his shirt holding the bomb. Inside the bank, Wells quietly approached a teller and handed over a cryptic note sealed in a white envelope. It tersely ordered, gather employees with bolt codes and work fast to fill bags with $250,000. You have 15 minutes he then lifted his shirt to reveal the device strapped to him, confirming the bomb's existence. With no way to open the vault on such short notice, the terrified teller handed Wells a near $8,702 in cash. Wells appeared neither scared nor cocky, but eerily calm throughout the ordeal. With the cash in hand, he grabbed a red lollipop from the counter and sauntered out as a woman quickly dialed 911. Just three minutes later, police swarmed the scene. A chilling trail of detailed instructions remained inside Wells' car, leading him step by step through a morbid scavenger hunt. The first note ordered, exit bank with money and go to McDonald's. At the drive the sign, find the rock, taped with your next instructions. Shortly after leaving the bank, Wells was stopped by state troopers and handcuffed. Despite pleading with them about the device strapped to him, they left him shouting for help on the pavement while they called the bomb squad to the scene. The officers had confirmed the bomb's existence with their own eyes. It was only a matter of time now. The sinister instructions found in Wells's car offered no hope, stating, this powerful booby-trapped bomb 
can only be removed by following our orders. Act now, think later, or you will die. The notes warned he was being watched, and if anyone interferes, we may detonate the timer or cell phone detonator. The reckless plan assumed he could rob $250,000 while driving a Geo Metro around the city wearing a live bomb, all without police interference. Hours after Wells perished, police tried to complete the complex scavenger hunt themselves, chasing clue after clue until finally reaching a dead end. Whoever devised this scheme had clearly abandoned it once cops swarmed the bank. Notably, the instructions repeatedly used we and us, suggesting multiple conspirators behind the sinister plot. And so, the hunt for suspects began. First on the list, William A. Rothstein, a 6 foot 6 inch eccentric loner known for wearing dungarees and keeping pens in the chest pouch of his disheveled wardrobe. Rothstein was an eccentric figure, conversant in multiple languages, an engineer, and formerly a high school shop teacher. But less than a month after Wells's bizarre death, Rothstein made a strange call to the police. There's a frozen body in my garage freezer at 8645 Peach Street, he explained calmly, claiming he was just storing it as a favor for a friend. That friend was Marjorie Deal Armstrong, an on-again, off-again romantic partner of Rothstein's. The body belonged to 45-year-old James Roden, Deal Armstrong's boyfriend, whom she had shotgunned to death in her bedroom back on August 13th. Given their turbulent history, Rothstein had agreed to dispose of the murder weapon and harbor Roden's corpse after the grisly crime six weeks prior. But Rothstein drew the line when Deal Armstrong suggested grinding up the body. He was taken into custody shortly after his disturbing call. In exchange for immunity, Rothstein agreed to testify against his erstwhile lover. He confessed to feeling incredibly guilty, even contemplating suicide at one point. Among Rothstein's belongings, police uncovered a suicide note. Chillingly, it began. This has nothing to do with the Wells case. It was an odd thing to declare if the two weren't connected. Or perhaps, just maybe, the ramblings of a man with a guilty conscience. On the surface, the only link between Rothstein and Wells seemed to be pure coincidence. Rothstein's house stood near the remote TV tower site of Wells' final pizza delivery that fateful day. Mere minutes on foot separated the locations. Additionally, the call that ordered the pizzas originated from a payphone outside a shell station just half a mile from Rothstein's home. The manager, Lorraine Blodgett, often saw Rothstein there. He'd buy some cookies and newspapers, then sit in his car eating pizza and read for hours, she recounted. When combined with the unprompted mention of Wells in his suicide note, Rothstein's connection to the crime scene seemed suspicious indeed. Further digging uncovered his mechanical talents. Police searching his home found power tools, welders, and piles of machinery parts. As one article noted, Rothstein clearly had the know-how to construct the ingenious bomb device that claimed Wells's life. The bomb was an intricate apparatus of bent metal and pipes holding smokeless powder charges, a combination lock, and a hinged collar intended to clasp shut around the victim's neck. Investigators concluded the bomb's intricate construction required professional-grade tools. In 2007, a grand jury determined Rothstein had disposed of over 1,000 pounds of incriminating evidence in a landfill after the fact. For that, suspicion fell on another, the volatile Marjorie Deal Armstrong. After Rothstein reported the murder of James Roden, police entered Deal Armstrong's fouled home, strewn with feces, clutter, and food cartons, donning hazmat suits for safety. Deal Armstrong already had a reputation around Erie, with a history of violence. She'd shot a boyfriend dead in 1984, but was acquitted on claims of domestic abuse. Former classmates recalled her high intellect, warring with madness. She suffered a cocktail of mental illnesses, including bipolar disorder, paranoia, and narcissism, and was prone to wild mood swings and rapid, uncontrolled ramblings. As an old classmate, now District Attorney Brad Falk, assessed, she thinks she's smarter and slicker than anyone else. At the end of the day, she believes she'll win. That's how it's been for 40 years. Deal Armstrong fit the profile of someone who would engineer an unnecessarily elaborate bank heist, if only to satisfy her ego. She seemed the type to brag about pulling off such a genius plan. FBI profilers pegged the collar bomber as a hoarder, handy with machines and tools, who preferred working solo and took pride in their engineering double-duty contraptions, like a bomb collar or shotgun cane. This description matched the pairing of Deal Armstrong and Rothstein, her violent history and superiority complex, his mechanical skills, and his access to equipment. But Deal Armstrong wasn't the only suspect. A new name emerged in 2005, Kenneth Barnes, a former TV repairman turned crack dealer. In 2007, 27-year-old sex worker Jessica Hoopsick claimed she knew Wells through Barnes. She alleged Wells had been a client at Barnes's home. Hoopsick and Wells were connected through phone records, as were Hoopsick and Deal Armstrong. It turns out Barnes and Deal Armstrong were old fishing buddies. Barnes had supplied Hoopsick with drugs, linking this trio to Wells prior to the botched heist. What a tangled web in this small town. Barnes had run his mouth about the collar bomb plot reported by his outraged 
outraged brother-in-law while Barnes sat in jail on unrelated drug charges. Witnesses placed Barnes and Deal Armstrong driving near the remote bomb site. Offering to trade information for a reduced sentence, Barnes confirmed the FBI's suspicions. Deal Armstrong was the criminal mastermind. According to Barnes, she needed money to pay him for a hit on her father, whom Deal Armstrong believed was blowing through the inheritance she felt entitled to. Though claiming ignorance about most of the plan, Barnes had already corroborated the FBI's intelligence. For weeks, informants had reported Deal Armstrong bragging about the bomb plot in great detail. A cellmate said Deal Armstrong confessed to killing her boyfriend, James Roden, for threatening to expose the scheme. While jailed for Roden's murder, Deal Armstrong promised the FBI she'd tell them all if they moved her to a minimum security prison near Erie, but she insisted she had no involvement with the bomb plot. Despite supplying the kitchen timers used in the device and being spotted within a mile of the bank when it was robbed, Deal Armstrong agreed to drive FBI agents around Erie, pointing out her movements the day of the heist. She admitted being at the Shell station buying gas with Rothstein and Barnes, placing all three at the scene. Rothstein, she confirmed, had made a call from the station payphone right before Wells's death. She'd already provided enough evidence to indict her. Desperate, she claimed Rothstein masterminded the entire plot and insisted Wells was a willing participant, the fourth and final suspect. Indeed, Wells's composed demeanor during the robbery seemed odd for a coerced bank thief, and no proof backed his claim of being ambushed by unnamed assailants. His eerie, calm, troubled investigators, who could never fully rule him out as a conspirator. In 2007, District Attorney Mary Beth Buchanan concluded Wells was in on the plot with Rothstein, Barnes, and ringleader Deal Armstrong. She believed the partners planned to double-cross Wells after he robbed the bank, but panicked and abandoned him once the cops intervened. Since Wells never stood a chance at completing the convoluted scavenger hunt alive, DA Buchanan concluded he was a knowing participant given a bomb collar as an alibi. The device ensured he'd go through with the heist and hand over cash, while answering he would not survive to be a witness against the others. Informant Barnes claimed a chatty Wells had discussed plans a month prior. Another witness corroborated this to the FBI. In July 2007, D.A. Buchanan closed the four-year investigation, charging Deal Armstrong and Barnes with executing the crime and naming Rothstein and Wells as conspirators. After interviewing over 8,000 people, authorities believed Wells was involved from the start. Barnes insisted Wells agreed to help in exchange for money due to an expensive relationship with escort Jessica Hoopsick. The 2007 indictment states Wells believed the bomb was fake, merely a prop to fool police if caught. He could then blame the ominous instructions. But Barnes claimed that when Wells arrived at the TV tower and saw the collar bomb was real, he tried fleeing, only to be locked into the device at gunpoint. D.A. Buchanan argued that over time, Wells went from willing conspirator to unwilling participant, double-crossed by the others. But a week later, the FBI deemed the entire plot an elaborate hoax, that the bomb was real and would have killed Wells regardless. Despite officials calling Wells a conspirator, his outraged family firmly maintains his total innocence. As D.A. Buchanan closed the investigation, Wells' sister angrily cried, Liar! The chaotic aftermath unfolded as follows. In 2011, Marjorie Deal Armstrong received life plus 30 years for masterminding the heist, still claiming she never knew Wells and was not the killer. She died in prison in 2017. Kenneth Barnes was sentenced to 45 years, reduced to 20 for cooperating. William Rothstein passed away from cancer in 2004 before being charged. Some, like ex-FBI agent Fisher, believe Rothstein was the true criminal architect. As for Wells, debate still rages regarding his level of involvement. Prosecutors call him a conspirator, but strange actions like letting bank customers escape and leaving an easy trail don't fit that neatly. His family insists on his total innocence. In the end, it seems Wells' role extends no further than a fateful pizza delivery, yet for many, questions linger. Though Armstrong, Rothstein and Barnes seem clearly implicated, the case of Brian Wells remains chillingly unresolved. Was he an innocent pizza delivery man, cruelly embroiled in a deadly conspiracy, or a willing participant who got cold feet and paid the ultimate price? We may never fully unravel the enigmatic life and death of Brian Wells. This tragic thriller leaves behind more puzzles than answers. Thank you for watching.